All right, hey, um, welcome everybody to my very first YouTube submission. Uh, my name is Rich, and uh, what we'll be talking a little bit about is um, a project that I've been thinking about for a while to demonstrate some print circuit board techniques, some electronic design uh, techniques, and um, uh, that sort of thing. And so this project will be an XLR to USB converter, uh, so an audio product, and um, uh, hopefully you you enjoy it, and we do quite a bit more of these things. So the goals of this project are are kind of there's kind of a lot of them. One of the things I wanted to to show is share my experiences after over 15 years of being a, an embedded systems engineer and embedded developer and, and things like that. Lots of different products in audio software-defined radio, RF, and um, uh, nuclear projects, things like that. They're, they're just all sorts of very, very cool things that I've, that I've worked on. And I have not seen a lot of cradle-to-grave design processes for the electronic uh, hobbyist, do-it-yourself maker, or even a new or experienced engineer who wants to, to try out something new. So in the spirit of some projects that I really liked, such as Linux from scratch, we're going to try to build an entire product from its requirements, picking parts that are the right parts for the job, um, and taking kind of nothing for granted. It's, uh, it's, it's great to download an existing design off the internet. It certainly saves a lot of time, but I've really, I did most of my learning by, uh, having to go the hard way. I couldn't afford expensive tools. A lot of the open source stuff that we enjoy now was not around when I was starting out. And it's it's a really fun experience um, uh, to go through and build something just from the ground up. So you, you don't need to wait for the internet to tell you how to, how to you know, here's my library and that's what makes it. Any product with this uh, kind of knowledge, there, there's nothing beyond your capability. So, um, with that, um, we're, we're going to go into the entire uh, design process. I also want to show, in particular, some of the, the machinations of working with a particular printed circuit board design tool called Eagle uh, from Autodesk. You'll notice that I use an older version of the software, a professional version, and I liked Eagle a lot, especially for the price. And now with, with Autodesk, it's uh, it's free for a lot of a lot of people, a lot of educational things and hobbyists and stuff like that. Um, it was good enough when it first came out that I um, that I paid a thousand dollars of my own hard-earned cash for for this product. It, I, I like it a lot, but it does have a little bit of a personality, and a lot of the commands are will seem arcane. Just remember that they were invented before a lot of the uh, common practices in computing, like copy and paste, were really solidified. We just we didn't have them. Uh, not everyone agreed on how copy and paste should work, so. Um, the original developers uh, came up with their own way of doing it, and, and you just got to adapt a little bit to it. But uh, the Autodesk version is largely the same as the, the CAD soft version, the, the original version that I'll be using. Um, it's got a kind of a nicer user interface, and it's got a few extra features, which uh, you'll probably hear me comment a little bit on. Um, I have used both, I just haven't uh, bothered to buy a new version of it again. Um, <clears throat> after you've built your circuit board, we're going to have to uh, walk you through a little bit of the process of submitting it to a board house. Um, there's lots of YouTube videos about that. And a lot of vendors that make their own tool, um, like ExpressPCB makes its own CAD tools. And those are those are perfectly great. But they also do lock you into a particular vendor. So by going through the process of creating Gerber files, um, you, you're universal at that point. Everybody takes Gerbers. So everybody takes the Exelon drill files. Um, so you can do everything that you need to do. And, and this is about building the capability to, to have any, uh, any board house, any microprocessor, anything that you want. We're not beholden to any particular vendor. Um, along that same line, we're going to talk uh, towards the end as we get into the, the interesting stuff for a lot of people, which is the software side of things. And this is where I put on my embedded software programmer hat to show you how the USB device class uh, for audio, USB audio device class works. And um, we're going to code this thing from scratch in the same way. 
it's true that a lot of the vendors who make USB microprocessors have libraries out there, but we can use those for reference and, and to show good practices. That certainly I've, I, I steal those, those good ideas all the time. But the, again, the spirit is to, to build it from scratch. And so along that line, we will not need anything but a C compiler and a handful of, of small tools and then the debugger that's used. But we won't need fancy IDEs. We'll use mostly uh, GNU GCC and GNU Make, GNU Bing Utils. Uh, for for the processors that we're interested in, assuming they have that or whatever, we use command line stuff because a slick uh, integrated desktop environment is a great debugging tool. But you'll learn more from uh, going through it the, the little bit of the hard way, a little bit the arcane way. And the nice thing is, you are way way ahead of the curve once you know how uh, a microprocessor bootstraps. For example, what happens when the power turns on? Where is the first instruction executed at? How does the memory get cleared? Uh, how are drivers set up? Device drivers uh, within for the different appliances within the chip. So we're gonna go through all that stuff, and and I really really enjoy that stuff. That's why I like uh, embedded systems programming. So let's talk about the requirements of this particular product. Okay, so we need to have USB connectivity, right? That's that's part of the goal. So that's cool. And we want to have a single audio input. That doesn't mean that it's going to be a one-channel device, as we'll talk about it here next. Um, but it's it's only going to support one input. Um, I would, however, like to have two features. We're going to demonstrate an interesting bit of audio that talks about a phenomenon called dynamic range. And what you notice in, in audio is dynamic range is basically the ratio between the loudest portions and the softest portions. The softest portions uh, are determined by the noise floor. You know, anything quieter than the noise floor will get swallowed up in the hiss, the background hiss. If you've ever had an audio device where you, you cranked it up too high and you just hear this, this white noise in the background, it has a high noise floor. Uh, on the other side of things, the high side of the, the dynamic uh, range is determined by how high a voltage you can get into it. And unfortunately, human voices have a lot of dynamics to them. Even as I'm talking to you right now, I have portions where I'm, I'm kind of talking real quiet like this and there's not a whole lot in there. And then there are portions where I get really energetic and, and I, I start to, to articulate very, very strongly or, you know, something like that, right? So dynamic range is, is, that, is, is that, that ratio between how high and, and basically the noise floor of something. There's, there's a couple of other sub-definitions like crest factor, which is the peak to average and, and, and things like that. Um, but um, I'd like to have both, and in order to do that, um, I, when I say I'd like to have both, I'd like to have the best of both worlds. I'd like it to have it raw, but I'd also like to have things kind of calm down a little bit. So we will be using a, a audio technique called a dynamic range compression, where uh, there's a circuit in there that as you get too loud, it begins to back the gain down. There's a threshold by which it begins to uh, back you down in the volume control as you get loud. This is really good for things that, that people do in voices like plosives, which are b, p, 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 t, t, uh, and sibilances, like s. T is a little bit kind of halfway in between. I don't remember exactly where it is in the, in the official definition from the psychoacoustics of things. But um, uh, these have a lot of high energy to them. P has a lot of low frequency pop to it. And uh, sibilances, s, s, has a lot of broadband, almost noise sound. You can even model it as a noise source. Uh, these are high energy, and they can drown out or clip out the, the audio converter if you're not careful. Okay. So um, we'd like to get both, and, and I'll show you in a, in a second how we're going to do that. I'd also like to try to keep the coding on the PC side, the Windows and Linux side, kind of to a minimum. I really don't want this to be focused on writing drivers, and I know that that's a complicated issue. There's, there's lots of good information out there on there. We're going to stick with the standard USB audio class specifications with both um, Windows and, and Macs and, and uh, PCs all have standard drivers. So we won't have to write drivers uh, on the PC side of things. And we're going to focus on what I think is the more fun stuff, which is the embedded system stuff. There's, there's a lot less information out there on how to, how to code that stuff um, really well. So we're just, we'll make some room in our schedule by, by not doing much fancy driver stuff. I'd like to have a small footprint 
because uh, I'd like to see if we can't cram this thing into a single uh, tube somewhere. I, I don't want a box that sits on your desk. I'd like it to be something that kind of is in line with the microphone that you're connecting it to. I also want to support a professional grade of microphone, and, and there is a type of microphone that's often used in, in sensitive applications. Many of you probably, if you're musicians, you probably know about it. It's known as a condenser mic. Condenser mics need external power applied to them. They're not, uh, unlike a dynamic mic or ribbon mic or carbon mic, they don't generate electricity. They modulate existing electricity, or in the case of some with uh, back-end uh, pre-drive, pre-amplifiers in them, they need to power a, a, an amplifier, a small low noise amplifier built into the into the chip or into the um, the microphone house. So we'll support that. Um, uh, and that phantom power, which is kind of a higher voltage than you might think, um, is also uh, uh, needs to come from USB. I don't want to have a battery. I don't want to have a, a power cord coming out. So those are our requirements. And like we said, cradle to grave engineering means we start with requirements. What should this thing be and not? And that's, that's, a, that's a good enough list. We'll probably find some other bells and whistles that maybe we'd like to have, some derived requirements and stuff. But this gives you the basics of what me, the customer of myself, wants to do. Okay. So this is kind of a topology for the design to implement what we just talked about. Okay. On one side, we have a PC connected via USB. And on the other side, we have a microphone. And in between, in this dotted line, that's us. That's where this design process will take. There's only a handful of major components inside there. There's, there's a few support components, but for the most part, we're going we're gonna to basically just have these components on there. There's not much else in there. The processor does lots of stuff. It has to retrieve samples from the analog to digital converter. It has to talk USB. And USB is not a simple protocol. If you've worked with UARTs or SPI or I2C, USB ain't like that. USB is a layered protocol. It has... Um, uh, a bus network. It has a, a network, uh, like you would think of as Ethernet, to step a little less complicated in that. There are routers and hubs. There's um, lots of devices sharing the wire at the same time. There's timing concerns. There's lots of good stuff. So we're going to, uh, as we get past the uh, physical hardware design, we're going to talk a little bit more about the USB interface. The processor has to support that. Okay? It also has to control the analog to digital converters and the phantom power and a few other things like that. So the processor is going to be busy. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's got to be a complicated one. The analog to digital converter's job is to, you know, to take analog and turn it into digital, as, as the name says. And it has a crystal or a clock source in order to support that. Um, our microphone will go into a preamp, although we might change a little bit of that topology. It might not be a separate part. So it might be part of the ADD, part of the compressor. There's a couple of things we haven't quite figured out yet. Um, but the same source will go through the compressor and come into the A to D as a separate channel. Um, so we don't have, this is not a two-channel analog device. It's a two channels of different representations of the same signal. So that's our basic design, pretty straightforward. Um, and we should, we should be able to knock this, this out. This will be a fun project. So what is all this phantom power? Well, phantom power is a 48-volt signal that lives on, on the audio wires of the XLR connector. It's not a high power signal, so we'll support a couple of milliamps, uh, and that should be plenty. Uh, usually, you, you, you're lucky if you get a milliamp out of that thing. Okay? But it has to be low noise. And we deliver it through a couple of resistors, uh, there's different values of resistors, uh, from pin 2 and pin 3 of the XLR connector, reference to ground. I haven't decided yet how we should control turning on and off phantom power, because it doesn't need to be on all the time. And one of the things that it does is when you plug in a uh, non-phantom powered microphone into it. It's not damaging to the microphone, but as you plug it in, you get this big pop. And um, so why use it if we don't have to? Um, right, so it should be should be able to turn it off. Um, I went through a lot of stuff. I went through some, some DigiKey stuff. I uh, used DigiKey a lot for, for different products and stuff. And I came up with this Maxim part. And I liked it because it was small. It was not it required to do lots of uh, different um, uh, current and it was a pretty simple thing. Even though this schematic right here looks complicated, this is for a trans impedance amplifier for a um, for a laser diode source. We don't need that stuff, right? We're going to mostly focus on the series inductor and diode, which give us the high voltage that we want. 
the feedback resistors here, which set up the um, uh, the output voltage. And we won't use this adjustment thing that we can dynamically change the bias level or any of that other stuff. We don't need any of that stuff. We probably will use the shutdown line. Uh, maybe we'll use a current limiter for something fun, but probably not. Okay. So simple circuit, pretty cheap, uh, and it does high voltage, and that's that was the other thing. High voltage is a relative term with these things. You know, I certainly could find 500 volt converters and do something crazy like that, but I'm, I'm looking for a small chip that, that gives me the full 48 volts. By the way, you can do phantom power with 12 volts or 24 volts. You can do it with lower, but the standard in professional audio is 48 volts, so we're going to try to support that. The processor itself is uh, still kind of to be decided, but here's the requirements that we need out of it. It needs to have USB. Um, it does not necessarily, you know, you might say, why 2.0? Why not um, 3.0? That's the latest and greatest. And the answer is we just don't need it. You pick the processor that you need based off the requirements that you have. If we don't need USB 2.0 high speed, if we can use USB 1.1 high speed, then we will. Um, there is no sense in the professional engineering environment of putting in something just because it's the latest technology, unless you're worried about parts obsolescence, which I'm not with USB 1.1. People are not going to stop supporting 1.1. Three point, um, USB 3.0 interfaces are backwards compatible, so I don't have to pay for for the uh, extra cost of that more expensive chip. I also need the uh, thing to have its flash memory or its ROM memory on chip. I don't want to stick a external um, chip on the end of this processor just to hold the code. There are mechanisms um, in the world of USB to squirt code into a, an idle processor after it's been plugged in and powered up to bootstrap it. We ain't going to do that stuff. It's too complicated of a, of a driver code for, for this project. I want to focus on the, the embedded stuff. So um, we're going to keep it, we're going to keep it simple. Um, the footprint, I put down QFN, which is quad flat, no lead, is a very small package and it does make some manufacturing difficulties. But uh, as we get uh, later on, I'll, I'll bring it to, to my lab and show you a couple of cool things that you can do to make um, uh, QFN and high-tech packages like that uh, within your grasp. But QFN is a small footprint, and if I'm going to try to fit this in a small little, little tube, then uh, we need small. And finally, it's got to have a UART. I will never build a processor that doesn't have a UART. That's where you get your debug information. That's where you get uh, status updates and low-level commands and, and all sorts of good stuff. Don't ever be without a UART. You, you, as you do embedded software programming, <laughs> you wish you had. And the fun thing about that is we will build, this is going to be fun for those of you who've done C coding before, we're going to build a printf from scratch. That's one of the things that we'll do. I've done that a lot, um, and I got it kind of a design that I like. Uh, and it's not as, as impossible as you might think. That's one of those kind of, you don't, you usually get a printf from with your compiler, and GCC has a great one, but we're going to build our own. It's, this one's, it's, it's, it's fun to do. You learn a lot about C if you don't already know. So here's a couple of processor candidates. Um, one is by Texas Instruments, the TMS 320C5 series, which are fixed point digital signal processors. The size of it is, is pretty small, 12 by 12 millimeters, not as small as I would like. And this is a BGA package. So QFN has, has the, the uh, bumps for solder connection coming out the edges, but it doesn't have legs. They're kind of just jammed up into the edge of the, uh, uh, the solder kind of uh, lives on the edge of the package. BGAs have, a lot of you probably know what they are, they're, they're little balls on the bottom. So this is a way to get a small package with a lot of pins on it. The price, 10 bucks. Uh, these are DigiKey prices, and um, uh, you can't go wrong with DigiKey prices um, for budgetary reasons. Um, those are, the, the, that's a little more expensive than I might think, because usually when I spec out a part, I say I'm going to sell it for four times what my manufacturing labor and overhead is. Um, that's that's my rule of business thumb. Um, the pros on it are it's got a full DSP. It now has a full compiler. Code Composer Studio is now free. It wasn't always, so I'm very happy that Texas Instruments is, is doing that. Um, the cons are it is a little bit bigger. The cost is a little higher. And for me, this is a new development platform. I, I've done a lot of DSP, but mostly with analog devices, Sirius Logic, Wolfson, um, Teak DSP, 
and FPGA work and, and lots of other things like that. But I have not actually had the pleasure of working on a Texas Instruments DSP project. So that would be new for me, which would be cool. Um, but um, maybe that's maybe that's acting a little bit too much. Maybe we should just play it safe so that, you know, uh, I can give you the best of my experience rather than having to learn something new along with you. So another processor is kind of the opposite direction is a lower tech solution, an Atmega uh, 16A4U which is um, an 8-bit microprocessor, so it has no DSP, uh, but maybe we don't need that. After all, this is a fairly simple thing. I'm not talking about adding echo or effects, reverbs, um, you know, automatic echo cancellation, lots of cool algorithms we could do. We could have a lot of fun with that, that TI chip uh, building in neat algorithms to that, so that might be a pro in, in that area. On the other hand, this guy is dirt simple, and if his job is just to faithfully deliver A to D samples up into our, our processor or up into our, our personal computer, this is probably a better choice uh, because there's not there's not much that has to go on. USB is going to be is going to be complicated enough, you know. So um, maybe we don't want to add to that. So I haven't decided this. Pros on it: another free compiler. It's GCC. I've used GCC a lot. Um, I know it well. Simpler programming, because we're not talking about uh, doing a whole lot of DSP stuff or, or anything like that. Uh, the con is that same thing. It's just it will be uh, in, unable to, um, to do that stuff, and maybe we'll wish later on that we had some, some more power inside there. Let's talk about this compressor, right? So what is the purpose of a compressor? The purpose of it is to try to control that dynamic range. You know, keep the louds from getting too loud and um, try to remove that background hiss that's so annoying when nothing's happening at all. So the compressor, as it gets above a certain threshold, will actually um, begin to reduce the gain. So for every, for every uh, decibel of input range above the threshold, rather than giving you one more dB out, it gives you only a half, let's say, or a third. And this is a great way, actually, it's very, very effective of controlling those plosives. You know, we can set up the response times and stuff like that. They're used mostly in, well, they're used all the time in cell phones nowadays uh, to keep things from overdriving. But let's see if we can't build that into our, our microphone. Uh, a gate is is uh, sort of like an automatic mute, right? As the signal gets too, too low, it just finally says, it's too weak and I'm going to shut you down. Keep that hiss away. Uh, if you're listening to my audio now, it's from a a cheap microphone inside of a Logitech webcam. And so the audio signal isn't great. That's one of the things that inspired me to do this <laughs> this project is to say, I don't I don't really have the kind of microphone interface that I that I'd like. Let's see what we can do about that. Um, we're gonna use the uh, the second channel of our audio codec to to get this raw channel. And the one that I like, which is apparently mistyped on this this slide, is the SSM 2167 from Analog Devices. It's a really good part. We'll talk a little bit more about it and stuff like that. Um, and this is the topology. You see it's got um, a level detector and a voltage controlled amplifier. And so you get a, um, a measurement of how loud it is. And then you use that to control um, to control the, uh, the voltage, uh, the um, uh, volume coming out. So cool little chip. I use it a lot. The codec, uh, which I, I call codecs, and I call them ADD converters, and they're not actually the same, but I'm in the habit of calling them codecs. Usually a codec is a combination of A to D converter and D to A converter, uh, isn't it? So it needs to have two channels to support my compressor and raw thing. Again, small footprint. Um, I'd like to have an output that's compatible with a bus called SPI, SPI, Serial Peripheral Interface, for those of you who've done Raspberry Pi or, or uh, Arduino things, you're probably familiar with SPI. The nice thing about that is it's pretty compatible with common uh, audio interface standards that are known as um, I squared S, inner IC sound, um, which is not to be confused with I squared C, which is another control protocol. That's a, that's a completely different thing. They just happen to share a couple of letters. So uh, I'd like it to be SPI compatible, um, which is pretty pretty easy. Uh, but I'd also like it to have a phase lock loop if I can get one. And what that does is that a phase lock loop is kind of like an adjustable um, oscillator. 
so I can adjust the sample rate uh, the way that I'd like to. And that that's nice because I will need a crystal to run the um, to run the processor. Probably there's there's a couple of options out there that are crystalless, but I don't think I'm going to use them. But the quality of the audio is such that I really do want to have a, a crystal associated with that, a, a dedicated low phase noise crystal that keeps the the audio quality is, is from getting a turn uh, something called jitter or phase noise. So a phase lock loop allows me to use a cheap crystal to get the audio frequencies that I that I would like. And if you notice, audio frequencies are a little strange. Say 44.1 instead of 40 or something like that, right? So the human ear is basically insensitive um, above 20 kilohertz, regardless of what probably a lot of people who swear they have better hearing. Eh, statistics are, are against those people. So 20 kilohertz is really, really good. Um, the pro and the problem is there's a theorem in signal processing called the Nyquist theorem that requires uh, for faithful reproduction, I have to sample at least twice as fast as the maximum bandwidth of the system. So if the bandwidth is 20 kilohertz, I have 20 kilohertz of audio that comes through there and no higher, I need to sample it at least 40 kilohertz. But there's a problem. Real filters to limit so that no extra things from your lighting sources or um, ultrasonic sources or noise sources from switchers on your PC or anything like that that could cause all sorts of really bad things if they get in there. Um, we put filters in to remove those things, and those filters aren't aren't from zero to sixty. You know, they, they they don't they're not on and then fully off. They have a roll off as they go down in frequency or as they go up in frequency. It takes them a few hundred hertz to get down to the point where they're really removing the the audio. So forty four point one kilohertz gives me two point one kilohertz of roll off. We're allowing frequencies higher than we can hear so that that filter has a chance to really do its its job and by the time the ultrasonics are in there they're way way down um, and then uh, the analog if, if the sampling rate is is 20 uh, there's 2.1 kilohertz and that means that I have 1.05 uh, right uh, so you know, the, the, the numbers work out when you when you do the the first the crystal frequencies, so I'd like to be able to support a couple of different sampling rates and, and an adjustable clock from a phase lock loop is nice. I do not want a headphone amp. Um, they they waste space and power, and that's really not so much a hard requirement. It's more of a filtering term when you're on DigiKey or something like that, or you're looking for one. Um, for this thing, if I say no headphone amps, that seems to be a column that a lot of people have on their selector guide. So by saying no headphone amp. That immediately gets me out of things that have outputs altogether. This is an input-only device, so um, don't need the power, don't need the space, um, uh, don't need the complexity flow. So the candidate that I like the best is from AKM Semiconductor. It's called the AK5701, and I've used um, AKM's products before. They're they're very high quality. They're they're very reasonably priced. Uh, they they're in a lot of professional equipment. They make some really really awesome stuff. And um, they also make some uh, some ones that are very close to what we need. So it's got all the features that we want. It's got, it's every one of those. So I like it a lot. The chassis that we want to use, we hadn't really talked about. This guy down here, this silver tube on the end of it, is an XLR connector, if, you, if you've never seen one before. I would like to fit this whole thing inside of a little tube of some sort. So here's a tube from Nutric, and here's a tube from Switchcraft. I could hijack this Nutric one and jam my stuff inside there, and that's kind of nice because the end caps of this particular guy here are interchangeable. I can put an XLR on them, can flip around the back and put a USB guy on them, and there's plenty of space, nice rectangular thing that I can probably fit when I need it. The Swisscraft one is a little nicer because it kind of follows the, the contour of a microphone a little bit better, where I would, I would just simply not use this end there. I'd just pick one, and this would be where the USB connection comes out. Um, and it's, it's, you know, they're, they're smaller, they're a couple, three inches long, um, but the diameter is a little small, so that might be tough mechanically to fit in. Uh, a third option is to actually fit it in line with an actual XLR connector. I don't think we'll be able to do that. I think it, there's just not enough space. So, um, so a couple of options here. Right. So that's the engineering project. I hope you like it, and I hope that it, um, 
it, it shows you kind of how an engineering project might go from basic requirements to beginning to select components. And now that we've kind of got a broad stroke of, of what the design looks like, we should be able to begin um, uh, begin work. Our first couple of, uh, first for several YouTube videos will be about operating Eagle, setting up a project, building all the parts. We will be building all of the parts. If you don't want to see all that stuff, just skip videos. It's, that's okay. Um, but they're out there for someone who wants to say, hey, you know, I've never built a resistor before, something real basic. Um, and there's a lot of fun you can have with um, with uh, building a resistor. You can, you know, hopefully, even people who've done it may, may learn some things. I certainly did as I was trying to figure out how to do that. So um, after we get through the um, the building the parts process, then we'll begin to uh, build the schematic. And uh, those will be in high def uh, so that you can kind of see where I'm zooming into. And um, there may be a little bit of fast forwarding there, but I'll try to give commentary of why I'm making certain design decisions and, and things like that as we build the schematic. And then we'll get into laying out the circuit board. And then we'll get into manufacturing that circuit board. And then we'll get into um, assembling it, soldering it down. Um, I won't go too much into soldering, although there's, we'll be using solder paste as our methodology. Uh, we won't be using a whole lot of stick and wire soldering because I wanted to show, um, you know, kind of, kind of the, the high tech stuff. There's, We'll be doing surface mount stuff in this. We'll be using fine line BGA type parts, perhaps, or uh, uh, leadless packages. These are all the very current technologies that everything you're using. If you open up a cell phone, you don't see um, the spider leg looking kind of centipede looking uh, chips that have holes drilled in them. We just simply don't don't make those. We, we make them, but but we don't use them in, in products anymore uh, unless they have to be interchanged. They're high inductance. Manufacturers don't even like carrying them on product lines anymore. I can help them. So um, these are the modern modern techniques, and and I hope uh, everybody likes it. Until next time.